Well, open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Yeah! We cheer when we open up the Bible. It ain't cheesy. It's awesome. It's better than the World Cup. It's better than Germany beating Brazil. Come on. <laughs> I got a lot of Brazilian friends. I was giving them a hard time. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Everybody say two, two. is better than one. All the married people said, amen. All the single people, someone's on the way for you. Well, it's going to be good. We're going to get into the Word and just allow God to speak to us this morning. So let's say this together. I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. My heart is open. My mind is ready to receive because God's not finished with me yet. And my best days are right in front of me. And I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. Do you believe that this morning? Well, Lord, we thank you, God, that we do have victory. Lord, it's no coincidence that this church is named Victory. God, that you've given us victory past, present, and future, God. And Lord, we thank you that this morning you're going to speak to us. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. God, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise for what you're about to do. God, that we'd walk out refreshed, encouraged, challenged God to do and be who you've called us to be. And Lord, let that overflow in our lives Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, into Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, you know, when I was first getting started um, in, in ministry, which is not too long ago, but I was 16. I didn't have a pulpit or a platform, but I just wanted to be used by God. And I remember uh, learning to play the guitar and learning to play the piano and thinking, God, maybe if I could write songs or play, play an instrument, maybe I could be used in the ministry in some way, in a band, in a worship team, or be used to travel and play music. And um, I remember forming this band. We, we were called Envoy, and we wrote songs. We recorded some albums. We got a band picture right there. Come on, somebody. The original Backstreet Boys. We were a boy band. And um, anyways, we had, we had songs that we released and, and we recorded and we got made fun of by all of our friends. Um, and we should have because we just looked too cool for school and we weren't that cool. But in all of that, um, we started traveling and started playing at different places and this one pastor called me and he said hey I've heard your album I know your parents and I want you to come minister at our church and I said awesome you know we'd love to and he said we I said yeah we're a band and he said well I was thinking more just like you and see this is this is like how many of you have ever read those documentaries or seen those stories of how bands get pulled apart the lead singer does a solo thing you know what I'm talking about how many of you just wish DC talk would get back together again <laughs> Come on, I'm a fan of the old DC talk, free at last. I love rap music, Jesus free. Come on, somebody. I mean, Toby Mac is good on his own, but I just think they all need to get back together. Some of y'all have no clue who I'm talking about. I just grew up in children's church listening to DC talk all the time. But see, this moment, the pastor said, well, what do you mean, the band? I was thinking just you. And I said, sir, I got to be honest with you. Me on my own, I'm not that great. But when I'm with the band, we sound better. Come on, say it with me. We sound better together we sound better together and he said okay you know how how better I said a lot better I said trust me you want the whole band we're gonna bring a good sound he said okay all right well the whole band come out and uh, we would make just enough money to pay for gas to get back to Tulsa and we would play for groups as big as 10 people sometimes 20 sometimes if we were really blessed a hundred people and um, and so when we got there in, in many places where we played at the sound system would kind of go in and out Anyone ever been there before where that's happened here before where sound system kind of goes in and out and you're like, is the mic going to come back on? Are we going to hear the instruments? And I, I just love it when just church breaks loose. Even when the mic goes out. Come on, somebody. But see, it went out and we started hearing one instrument come back at a time. So I'm going to play with the band this morning. We're going to groove and jam a little bit together. Give the band a big hand. But imagine if if it, it, it kind of went out and then one instrument came back on at a time. So we're going to try out one instrument at a time. And then as each instrument comes in, you guys just groove with me. Just let your, let your talents come forth. All right, here we go. We're going to make this really strong and just powerful.
when we're all bringing something to the table and this is what my music teacher taught me is that harmony is when each person plays their part of the melody harmony is not when everybody plays the same thing it's when they find their place to complement what the melody is and when they complement each other it sounds better better together and this is what the wisest man thank you band thank you for staying and playing for a little bit uh, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 says two are better than one for they can help each other succeed our job as a church is not to compete with each other, it's to complete each other. Turn to the person next to you and say, you complete me. <laughs> we complete each other. We're not called to compete, we're called to complement. As a body, as families individually, as married couples. See, the devil wants you fighting each other. He wants you standing face to face fighting, but see, God says, no, you're called to stand side by side and back to back, having each other's backs to work together and help each other succeed. We're, we're all wearing the same jersey, right? right? These days, it's like everybody wants to break off and do their own thing and be their own thing, but see, it's all about Jesus. No matter how old you are, how young you are, what color you are, we're all about breaching people that love Jesus and, and reminding that Jesus loves us. But see, the devil wants us to draw imaginary lines and isolate ourselves and pull ourselves apart from the people that God's called us to be connected to. And also, he wants us to kind of, uh, the devil loves to pull you into a, a, a mindset of it's all about you. See, in the band, there was that, that understanding that I'm only as good as the other band members when we're working together. The drummer, the guitar player, the piano player, the bass player. We all had to learn to complement one another and that we would make a better sound together. I love the story of Hillsong. How many have ever heard of Hillsong worship? Well, Hillsong, it began with one person who was writing all these songs, doing all of this stuff, and the senior pastor, Brian Houston, he sat down with the whole worship team and he said, okay, no more superstar status. No more one-man show mentality. We're going to be a team. We're better together. And he said, I want each of you working together to write songs, to make melodies, and we're going to make, we're going to make great music. That was in the early 90s. Well, today, they've made so many amazing worship albums that the church is singing, and they've got a team, not just Darling Check. they got Joel Houston, Marty Sampson, Young and Free Band. They've got all of these amazing songwriters. Why? Because they realized we're better together than trying to do this as a one-man show. And the church is better together, and God has great things in store for victory. But I'm telling you, we got to learn this lesson that we are better together, working together. And, and it's not all about one person. It's about the team that does their work, the ushers, the greeters, the altar counselors, the parking lot team with the Mickey Mouse hand, the camera workers that are standing behind the cameras, the sound men, the, the connect group leaders. Can we give a big hand to all the volunteers that make victory so so amazing. All the staff, the Dream Center, Camp Victory, Victory Christian School, the coaches, Coach Wakely up there. Let's give all the people a big hand that make Victory Christian Center strong. You complete me. I complete you. We need each other. We need each other. We thrive together. We succeed together. And then he goes on to say this in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 10. He says, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. See, when we're all alone, we're isolated. We got no one to help us back up. But, but what, what God's saying here is as a church, we're not called to kick someone when they're down. We're called to cover them when they're down and lift them back up. You know, I think about when I was younger, my parents really pushed for unity in our family. And, and it was good because we needed it. <laughs> And my dad took us on a road trip. He was going to take us all to Silver Dollar City. We were so excited to go. And so John and I always had to sit in the back of the van. And we were the youngest. And so 
we were in the very back, then Ruthie and Sarah in the middle, and then mom and dad in the front. And I remember John and I, we were just agitating each other, just like brothers do sometimes. We're 13 months apart. We were kind of hitting each other. And finally, I just drew an imaginary line. I said, do not cross this line. This is my space. That's your space. And John kind of went like that. I was like, stop that. Don't cross the line. This is my space. That's your space. Just stay to your space, and I'll stay to my space. Well, I kept annoying, like good, you know, babies do of the family. I was annoying him and annoying my sisters, and finally John crossed the imaginary line, and he hit me. And so I hit him back, and we started fighting, and all of a sudden, before we knew it, the van had been pulled over to the side of the highway. And my dad said, boys, out of the van. Yes, sir. And he pulled out the one thing he took on all trips, the paddle. And, and dad's paddle was a thick wooden paddle and on the back of it it said pray first <laughs> and he always had this lecture uh, about how correction equals love which I still didn't get you know all through uh, growing up but he said listen I'm gonna correct you and it's gonna it's gonna show how much I love you and we we're like what how does this show how much you love us and this is embarrassing we're on the side of the highway cars are driving by and, he says, this is going to drive all of that rebellion out of you right now. Let's pray together. Grab hands. So we prayed. And then he said, all right, spankings and, you know, spanked us. And then afterwards he said, okay, now you guys are going to get along because we still got time left on this trip and you've got to learn to get along, learn to work together. And he gave us, you know, this word about how we'll, we'll always be brothers. We can't escape the fact that we're brothers. And he said, brothers, you guys got to learn to love each other and work together because you're better together. And so, you know, he said, now, go kiss each other on the nose. <sighs> okay. So I went over there, and I was, Dad, this is embarrassing. People are driving by. and Yes, sir. You know, and so I kiss him on the nose. And now, John, you go kiss Paul on the nose. So John comes over towards me, and, and he bites my nose. <laughs> this, this left a scar in my life for a long time. And my dad said, that's it. And I go, I hate you, John. And I screamed. And dad said, no, we don't say hate. You don't hate him. You love him. And we had to get spankings again. And, and we fought. And then, you know, we're not perfect. And so he, he, you know, but he said this. He said, listen, we've got to learn to make the most of the time we have left by working together. And I'm so grateful because my brother and I have learned to work together. And he is such an incredible friend and brother with a pastor's heart. Loves me. Loves this church. And I'm better together when I'm working with my brother. And you're better together when you're working with others. And see, what the devil wants to do is to draw imaginary lines between generations, between ethnicities, between denominations. Well, we're this, we're this denomination of this denomination of this denomination. And we've so, we've so much drawn lines that we're getting further and further away from community. And we're isolating ourselves. And God says, listen, Jesus is coming back soon. Stop majoring on the minors. The main thing is Jesus. If we can keep the main thing, the main thing, and all get along with each other, we can really do something in our city, our state, our nation, and the world. The devil, more than anything, loves to divide and conquer. He works in the spirit of division, dividing churches. Well, they don't do things the way that they used to. Well, I just can't get along with people that are 30 years younger than me. Or I can't get along with people that are 30 years older than me. we got to learn to get along with each other. And I think we do. I think Victory does a great job getting along with each other. But see, the devil looks at people that are strong, and that's exactly who he wants to take off the list. The stronger you are, the bigger target you are for the enemy. He looks for the strong. And he looks and he studies, and the devil's not stupid, he's smart. He understands how to go after you. So the title of this message is Stay Together. Stay Together. The benefits of staying together, he goes on to say this in the same passage, verse um, 11. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? You know, and I'm grateful to have my wife who, who uh, were able to have that intimate relationship. And you know what? Even as you're single, God wants you to have intimate friendships like David and Jonathan. Someone who can stand beside you when you're going through tough times. Who can give you a hug or, or just say, hey, I'm with you. I I'm with you on this journey. You don't have to do life alone. You weren't created to go through storms alone. You weren't created to go through difficulties or temptations all by yourself. You're called to have a brother and a sisterhood all around you that's supporting you. But see, we've got to do our part to reach out and connect with those people that God's put in our path. It's no one's fault if you get isolated except for yours. 
God gives you plenty of opportunities to connect with people. But see, oftentimes we allow the lies of the enemy to pull us away from the people God's called us to be connected to in our family and in our church. Then he goes on to say this in verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Mom, will you stand up with me? I want to give you just a quick example. Will you stand back to back with me? All right, now move with me, Mom. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, no, keep moving the other way. There we go. All right. Now, when we're standing back to back, we're getting a 360 degree angle of how the enemy would try to attack us. If, if the enemy comes behind me, she's got my back. If the enemy tries to come and get her, I got her back. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Cha, cha, cha. Come on, give her a big hand. Now, watch, watch, though. The devil, he doesn't want you standing back to back. He wants you to get like this and start fighting each other. I don't get along with you. Why'd you say that? I saw the way you looked at me. I heard what you said. And the devil tries to get you frustrated with each other because he doesn't want you working together. He knows that if you're working, <laughs> he knows that if you're working together, you're stronger, you're smarter, you're held accountable. You can do greater things. She wanted to interlock arms. Connected. Come on, somebody. Connected. We're better together. That, that verse right there, verse 12, and then, he, and then he goes on to say this. There are even three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We've got to be connected with each other. The bigger the circle is, the stronger you are against the enemy. Who are you connecting with? Who are you relating with in the church? Who are you opening up to? Who are you going deep with? And not just talking about ESPN or your house or, uh, or, or LeBron James going back to Cleveland or whatever. Don't go shallow. Go deep. The devil wants your relationships to be shallow. He wants you to have a thousand friends on Facebook but no one to call. He wants you to have all the followers that you could get on Instagram, but no one to really have a deep conversation about what's really going on in your life. Because Instagram's not real. I mean, it's real, but we only post like the happy pictures. The devil doesn't want you to talk about what's really happening in your marriage, in your family, between you and your dad, between you and your son. But see, God set up relationships to help us win the battle against temptation, against depression, against isolation. And in Oklahoma, there's this thing that coyotes do um, in order to kill an animal. And what's crazy is they've killed some really big dogs uh, out at my friend's ranch. He was telling me the story. He said, Paul, coyotes, they, they have a very smart tactic on how they kill an animal. And he said, what they'll do is they'll run in front of the house because they know that we've got several dogs in our house. And he said, this has happened at multiple friends of mine out at their ranch. He said the coyote will run in front of the house to get the attention of the dog that's either inside the kitchen, looking out the window, or out on the porch, sitting, by the, the, sitting next to the owners. And when the dog sees the coyote, immediately he jumps up to go chasing it. And so the coyote will run, zigzag, and the dog will follow it through the fields. But what the dog doesn't realize is that the coyote is trying to pull him further and further from the house away from his turf, away from his environment, and, and away from his family. And, and so the coyote will pull him and then go into the woods. And so the coyote runs into the woods knowing the dog's going to follow it. And we're talking like a big German shepherd, not a small dog, a big dog. And oftentimes it is the big dog. It's the mighty. It's the strong. It's the I've got this together. I'm a DIY person. Do it yourself. I'm independent. I can do this on my own. And the dog goes chasing the coyote into the forest. And the owner said, there's a pack waiting that's hidden in the forest waiting to attack that single big dog all by himself because he can't handle the pack. Coyotes travel in packs. They attack in packs, but it looks like just one is there. What you don't realize is that they're waiting to surround you when they pull you out of your environment. And this is how the devil works. He knows as long as you're in the house of God, he can't touch you. He can't mess with you. But if he can pull you away from the family, away from the house, if he can use tools to uh, get you frustrated and anger, angry and bitter towards brothers and sisters God's called you to be connected to, if he can pull you away from that, he's got a better chance when you're isolated at attacking you. Just like animals attack prey when they're isolated, that's what the devil wants to do to you. 
And this is the doctrine of, of Balaam. If you look in Revelation 2.15, God says, I've got this problem with, with this church because they followed the doctrine of Balaam. What Balaam did in Numbers 22 through Numbers 25 is that he realized, I can't curse what God has blessed. Aren't you glad the devil can't curse what God has blessed? Somebody say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And it's not the clothes you're wearing, the car you're driving, or the house you're living in. Blessed is a bigger thing. It's, it's a supernatural ability to overcome adversity. Blessing is something that you carry with you no matter what you're wearing, no matter what you're driving. But see, the, the devil knew and Balaam knew, I can't curse them as long as they're standing in the house of God's blessing. But if I can get them to leave the house and go do what God's called them not to do, they'll curse themselves. And so what he did is he set up foreign women that were beautiful women to lure the men of Israel out of their camp to go and marry people that God said, I don't want you intermarrying over there. For all the singles in the house, you don't have to go looking in the club, the bar, to go find your wife, your husband. He's in the church. She's in the prayer room. He's in the Bible study. You can find the best right here. This is the cream of the crop. But what the devil wants you to think is that you can't get what you need in the church. You can't get satisfaction. You can't get fulfillment in your current marriage. you got to leave your house to go find it in an immoral woman, in an immoral man that's trying to rip you away from your husband. In some drug, in some drink, in some gambling, whatever it is. The devil knows what, what tempts all of us. And what he wants to do is isolate you because isolation is a setup for destruction. It is a setup for destruction. And, and not only that, isolation causes hallucinations. <laughs> you start seeing things and hearing things that aren't really there. Because you got no one to counteract those thoughts and those ideas in your mind. And hallucinations, I remember I was running one day. I had gone on a man trip and we were in the mountains of Colorado. And I said, I'm going to go run by myself. And I went go running out at Pikes Peak. I was running up these hills of this mountain. And after about a mile, I hadn't seen anyone. And so I started kind of getting nervous. And then I thought I heard something. So I stopped running. And then all of a sudden, I thought I saw something run past me. And I started imagining and believing there's a bear. There's a bear out here. There's a, a bear is following me. It's a big old grizzly bear. It's, it's probably 13 feet tall. It's a big brown bear with big paws and big teeth. And I'm all by myself. And so I started seeing, hearing, believing. And then hallucinations cause you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Do things against common sense. Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, An isolated man or woman uh, denies common sense. Denies intelligence from the outside. A and so all of a sudden, I start freaking out. I start running down the hill. I start zigzagging, thinking the bear won't get me if I zigzag. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose the bear. So I start zigzagging. And I ran for like 15 minutes just as fast as I could, zigzagging down the hill. And I got down, turned around, there was no bear. There was never a bear behind me. What, but I was by myself, so I believed there was. And this happens to people that are isolated. They start hallucinating, thinking things that aren't really true. They're talking about me. I know they're talking about me. They don't like me. I know they hate me. I'm just not going to, no, I'm not going there. I just know. And no one can break through the walls or climb up to the pedestal of which you've placed yourself on of isolation. And it's the devil's tactic to destroy you. Isolation is a setup for destruction. Now, if you have a Bible, go to 2 Samuel 18. Because we're going to look at this. I've got to catch my breath. <laughs> Here we go. 2 Samuel 18 is a prime example of how the devil lured Absalom into isolation. Absalom was the son of King David. He was a king's kid. He had everything he needed in the house, in the palace. But he got frustrated. He got bitter and upset. And so he began to pull away and start doing things on his own. He was handsome, strong, had a lot going on in his life. And, and so he kind of decided, I can, I can be independent from my dad, from my mom. He had no real friends, no real mentors, no receptivity, no teachability with anyone in his life. He had reached a point where advice was no longer really uh, accepted towards him. He, he just he took his own advice. He stopped taking advice from the outside. And so he formed his own army, and eventually he took his dad to war. 
And it's so interesting how this connects with the story of the coyotes is because Absalom led a bunch of men off the battlefield into the woods. Look at this, verse 5, David knew he had a small army left because all the, the nation of Israel had been manipulated and really deceived by Absalom. They were turning against King David, and King David yet in all of this remains confident that he knows God's got his back. And the king gave this command to Joab, for my sake, deal gently with young Absalom and all the troops heard the king give this order to the commanders. And the battle began in the woods of Ephraim. And the Israelite troops were beaten back by David's men. And there was a great slaughter that day. Over 20,000 men laid down their lives. Over 20,000 people were killed. And it says the battle raged all across the countryside. But more men died because of the woods than were killed by the sword. Everybody say, stay out of the woods. This story is really about Absalom following the desires of that were contrary to God's plan on his life. He left relationships he was called to be connected to. He disconnected himself. And, and, the, and the story is so tragic. He ends with his hair hanging in the tree branches of the woods. And he gets slaughtered there. And he dies and is buried in the middle of the woods. He never gets out. The good news is if you've gone into the woods, you can get out today. If there's breath in your lungs, there's hope for your future. You can get out of that affair today. You can get out of that addiction today. You can break free of that bitterness today. But here's real quickly some tools that the devil uses to try and isolate us. We're just going to go through this real quick. The first tool, it doesn't seem like a big one, but it's, it, it's so simple that it actually works is busyness. Busyness. The devil will use your being busy. I've got a lot going on. I'm busy doing stuff. I'm busy on projects. I'm a task person. And so I've got to work on tasks all the time. And you get so busy that you stop having relational depth in your life. You stop really spending time with family, with, with your spouse, with people in the church, going to a connect group. You're, you're one of those people. You're so busy that you come late to church and you leave early. You don't want to stick around for any conversations, relationship, building. I got to get somewhere. I got to go somewhere. I'm hungry. I got to do this. I got a task to finish at the house. And then I got to wake up at 6 and work and do all that. And so you get all these friends, but they're all shallow. You have no one that, you really, that really knows the real you. And busyness robs us of the relationships that God's called us to be in because we're better together. The second thing the devil uses is pride. Pride is a killer. Pride is saying, you know, I, I think I've kind of gone past all of that. I'm, I'm very, I've been saved for a long time. I don't really need relationships to hold me accountable. You know, the sad thing was, while we were out of town just this last week, we were looking for a church to visit, to, to just sit in on, and five of the biggest churches there in Florida, in that one city, had, had lost their senior pastor due to moral failure in the last eight months. See, what pride does is it isolates us. It places ourselves on this pedestal to say, I don't need accountability. I don't need relationships. I don't need someone checking up on me. I don't need people to know the real me, the real things that are going on. And it robs us of the relationships that God wants to use in our life to, to help us, to build us up, to strengthen us. We need each other. We can't do this alone. You weren't meant to live life solo. You were meant to do life together. You were meant for a duet. Come on, somebody. The third thing the devil uses is shame. Shame. Embarrassment of what you're going through right now. Maybe finances have been really tight, so hanging out with friends is just kind of embarrassing. Maybe, maybe marital problems have been so bad. Maybe there's issues with your family. Maybe there's issues between you and a friend, and so you've just kind of stopped hanging out because you feel ashamed, embarrassed by some of the mistakes you're making, mistakes that have happened in your life. And, and this, is, this is huge. Shame holds so many people back from real relationships. I had a friend in high school. He would hang out with us at football games, basketball games, but he would never really get involved in conversations. He was there. You could be someplace with all these people and still be isolated. You could be in church with a thousand people and still be isolated because you don't open up. You're ashamed of what you've walked through, ashamed of what you're going through. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's bankruptcy. I don't know what it is. But from this day on, make a decision. I'm not going to let shame hold me back from the relationships God's called me to be in. 
I need community in my life. We need each other. It's a humbling thing to think of, but it's true. We need each other. The fourth thing that the devil uses to try and come against us is insecurity. And, and Mark, would you come on up as I get ready to close? Insecurity. Fear. Afraid of being rejected. Afraid that people might take what you say and share it with a bunch of other people. Insecurity. It's an intimidation factor. I'm not good at talking with people. I'm not good at opening up with people. I'm, I'm more like uh, someone that just likes to be by myself. And see, Jesus, he didn't isolate himself. Yes, he did have secluded time in prayer, but he always spent time with his disciples. He always made sure to go back and be with Peter, James, John, and the rest of the disciples. I think about how, how even David, when he was going through one of the worst storms in his life, and he had to go to the caves to hide from his father-in-law, that it was there that God sent him brothers in those caves to hang out with them, to pray with them, to spend time with them. You need a brotherhood. You need a sisterhood. I'm talking about a Christian brotherhood and Christian sisterhood. God wants you to be connected with people that can lift you up, challenge you, encourage you, convict you. Some people don't like going to church because they feel convicted of sin. But see, it's that conviction that draws us closer to Jesus. It's that conviction that causes us to grow in our walk with God, not to become stagnant and let sin stay in our life. And we need friends that are holding us accountable to that. After insecurity, he uses gossip. He uses gossip because Proverbs says that gossip separates close friendships. Gossip gets between you, causes a wedge. I remember some, someone one time said something about another person that was talking bad about me. He said, yeah, so-and-so, man, they were really talking bad about you. And instead of going to that person to hear it from the horse's mouth, you know that, that phrase, you got to go to the person to hear what I just assumed. Assumption gets us in trouble. Assuming that everybody's talking bad about you or assuming that your friend was talking bad about you, it's, it's a devil's tactic to isolate you. He wants to pull you into the woods. He wants to pull you away from the family, away from the house, away from the marriage, away from the ministry. He wants to get you all upset. And man, I had a rough time, just me and that friend. There was tension there until finally I confronted him. I said, hey, did you say these things about me? The person said, no, I didn't. I remember I was there the day that those things were said. It wasn't me, it was someone else. And see, I had to forgive and let it go and trust. It takes, in order to have relationships, you've got to trust. I mean, that's the biggest thing there is just trust the person. The devil wants to get you all suspicious. No, I don't believe you. You were talking bad about me. No, you did do that. But suspicion, it isolates us. Being a suspicious person is a miserable way to live. I'm just sorry. I just have to speak straight. It's miserable to constantly be suspicious about all your friends. Suspicious about all the relationships in your life. At some point, we've got to get past all the past hurt and say, God, you put this person in my life to be my brother, my friend. And I've got to learn to work together because I am better together with my band, with my band of brothers, with our band of sisters than I am trying to do this solo. And the last thing, or the last two things is this, seducing spirits, it's rampant right now. Pulling men away from their marriage, pulling women away from their husband, pulling singles into a life of promiscuity and sexual immorality, sleeping around with everyone. See, this seducing spirits thing, it's, it's not just about sexual morality. It's about old addictions, old habits, going back to places you shouldn't go to. It's a seductive spirit to pull you out of the house. It's that coyote running in front of the house. You haven't tried me in a while. Been a long time since you smoked this. Been a long time since you drank this. Been a long time since you visited this club, since, since you did this. He's running in front of the house trying to get you out of the house. Stay in the house. Stay in the blessed place. Stay in the family of God. Stay in the marriage God puts you in. You need each other. The last thing is this, offense. The devil loves to get people offended. Well, you forgot my middle name at church today. You forgot to shake my hand last week. You forgot to appreciate me for those three hours I served at the Dream Center. And offense, it, it works together with pride. It's all about you. We make life about us. A church that's all about me is a church that will never succeed. A church that's all about you is a church that's unbiblically true. See, the church is not supposed to be about one person. It's about all ages, all generations. It's about all nations, all of us working together. 
and life and, and the body of Christ as Christians, we've got to get past the petty differences we have with each other. Offenses will come and go. I'll probably offend you. You'll probably offend me. But at the end of the day, we're family. So I've already decided I'm going to forgive you. Now, I need you to decide beforehand you're going to forgive me too. Otherwise, we ain't going to make it. We cannot make it in this journey together if we don't have forgiveness at the top of our list. Jesus even put it in our daily Lord's Prayer. Forgive me as I forgive those who trespassed against me. And that includes my pastor. That includes my connect group leader. That includes the greeter at the door that forgot my middle name. That includes my spouse. That includes my dad. That includes my mom. That includes my brother, my sister, that person over there. Forgiveness is the key that keeps us together. It's the glue. Stick together. Why? Because we're better together than we are apart, all up at odds with each other. We're better together. I want us to stand up all over this place.